All right, welcome. We are in the home stretch, people. Uh, four review lectures to get us ready for the AP exam in the next few weeks. Um, the way I'm organizing these, and I've already kind of got my, my note taker set up for all four of them, is splitting up the course into four different periods. So period one is 1450 to 1648, chapters one through six in the AMSCO textbook. Period two is 1648 to 1815, or chapter seven through 12. Period three is 1815 to 1914, or chapters 13 to 18. And then period four is 1914 to the present, or the last six chapters. What is that? Uh, 19 to 24. Uh, six slides for each one of these lectures, going over the main, uh, the main eras, the main time periods, the main ideas of each time period. Um, this will be especially helpful as you all are working on your review pack, um, because the slides are organized very similar to um, your review pack. Um, so um, our course starts in around 1450 or so with the Renaissance and with humanism. The Renaissance, hopefully you remember, was this, this cultural rebirth, this, this revival of, of uh, uh, intellectual ideas centered in Italy, in the Mediterranean. Um, and the Renaissance was grounded in this new idea of humanism. Humanism was all about human potential. Um, and within humanism were these smaller ideas of classicism, focusing on uh, classical Greek and Roman texts, also Greek and Roman architecture, Greek and Roman mythology in, in their arts. Individualism, which is the idea that man can be perfect, man can achieve greatness. And then secularism, which doesn't mean non, doesn't mean totally anti-religious, it just means non-religious, shifting a little bit away from the church. And so humanism, this big new idea of the Renaissance was grounded in an emphasis on the liberal arts, studying history, architecture, math, science, philosophy, um, the classics, in order to glorify man, in order to uh, help man achieve greater potentials and to achieve a new secular view of the world. It's moving away from this really rigid church only perspective and looking at the world in a new way. Um, so when we're talking about the Renaissance here, um, we've got kind of 1450s Italy, um, and there's a new idea, which is humanism. Um, and humanism is all about um, looking at the world um, um, in a secular point of view. And then there's kind of a focus on the potential perfection, let's say, of man. You might remember uh, the Book of the Cordier by Baldastar Castiglione that talks about how man can, uh, uh, should kind of be just as good with a pen than with a sword. Or Oration on the Dignity of Man by Pico della Mirandola, which says that man can achieve greatness, man can be perfect because they were created that way by God. Um, now, this idea of humanism is directly challenging traditional Christian views. And so we're going to see this is going to lead to the Reformation. Um, so this challenges uh, traditional views on religion and on art and on society. Um, and these ideas are able to spread all over uh, Italy and then all over the rest of Europe and eventually uh, to the world because of the printing press uh, created right around mid 1400s that allows them to spread their ideas. Um, we've got revolutionary artists like Michelangelo and da Vinci. We'll see some of their work in a moment that introduces perspective and secular subject matter. And then when the Renaissance spreads to the north, Germany, the low countries like Belgium, Netherlands, England, it becomes what's called Christian humanism. Um, uh, Desiderius Erasmus and Praise of Folly um, is the best example of this, um, which is basically um, um, the idea, okay, we're going to study classical texts, but rather than studying classical Greek texts, we're going to study classical Christian texts. And rather than becoming a better man, we're going to become a better Christian or create a better church. And so they uh, criticized um, church corruption in order to um, improve the church. And that's going to directly lead to the Reformation. The most important thing when you're studying the Renaissance is to be able to have a few works of art or works of literature kind of ready to share. And so School of Athens is one of the best examples of here. School of Athens by Raphael. Um, this is ancient Greek architecture, ancient Greek characters. So there's classicism. 
And then Plato and Aristotle here are having a debate. Where do we get our truth from? One of them points up and says, well, we get our answers from God. One of them instead points out forward and says, no, we get our answers from studying the world around us. That's humanism in a nutshell, not just relying on, on the word of God, but rather studying the world around us. Humanism, the liberal art, studying history to learn more about our world. And then we see individualism here as well. Every single person is in a unique perspective given their own unique characteristics. And some of the famous painters of the time have little uh, portraits in there as well. The Birth of Venus by Botticelli, another great example of Renaissance art. We see classicism right off the bat. Um, the uh, ancient Roman goddess of Venus. So there's classicism. Um, we also see secularism. There's no, there's no cross. There's, there's no Jesus Christ in sight. Um, instead, this is the celebration of nature. Um, and then we see individualism, uh, the beauty of woman, uh, the beauty of man, the beauty of nature. Uh, it's an, an individualistic idea. And then finally, we see David by Michelangelo, this massive 30 foot sculpture. Um, we see individualism here in two ways. First, we see the incredible attention to detail of Michelangelo's chiseled body, his chiseled abs and other parts. Um, so this, this uh, embracing the beauty of the human form, that's individualism. But we also see individualism in David's story. David from the Old Testament was uh, a shepherd who slayed Goliath and became king. Um, and so that's the idea that one lowly person can achieve greatness, individualism. Um, this is, um, yeah, an example of individualism in art. And so I'm not going to write all those little details down, but I might just say for some examples, you might think of School of Athens or the birth of Venus or David or, or, or creation of Adam is another good one as well. Have those ready. All right. Um, so the Renaissance starts in 1450s Italy. The Protestant Reformation starts in 1517 Germany and then moves beyond there. Um, and the Protestant Reformation is, is directly inspired by the Renaissance. They're inspired by humanism to um, look at the world uh, kind of through a new, maybe critical lens. And so Martin Luther's uh, uh, main criticisms of the church written out in 95 theses was indulgences. You might remember indulgences is when the church uh, uh, would, would uh, sell a get out of hell free card if you gave the church some money. Uh, there was also pluralism, which is when priests would hold multiple offices and not really do um, any of their jobs very well. Um, generally speaking, the church, capital C, Catholic church, had moved away from, you know, doing religious things and had become a business and a corrupt business at that. Um, and so Martin Luther, 1517, he creates the Protestant religion. He creates Protestantism. Um, and inspired by him are all sorts of other, uh, uh, other uh, uh, Protestant religions, Calvinism, Anabaptism, um, Zwinglianism, all of these, these offshoots of Protestantism. Um, Sorry, I've got a lot of sun in my face. Let's go the other way. Um, and when you talk about Protestantism, um, Protestants, Protestantism, um, I didn't spell it right. Um, believe in a few things. They believe in primacy of the scripture, which means the Bible is the most important thing. And we should only go to the Bible for uh, uh, religious truth. They believe in a priesthood of all believers, um, which means all uh, Christians are equal in the eyes of God. There should not be a church hierarchy. There should be no Pope. Um, and then they believed in uh, justification by faith and faith alone. Faith is the only thing that will save you. And so what does this mean? Um, well, all of a sudden this means that the Pope and the Catholic church have no authority. Martin Luther was not a politician. He was a, he, he was a monk. He was a deeply religious, deeply devout man. All he wanted to do was, was purify the church and, and get them closer to the true word of God. Um, but what, he, but what his, his uh, uh, words did is 
they had a huge political uh, domino effect because the Catholic Church lost immense power and the Catholic monarchs around the world, like the Holy Roman Empire, let's say, also felt threatened. Um, so the Catholic Church um, uh, responded. Uh, well, they were, were threatened um, and they lost power. And so they responded by banning uh, Luther. They attempt to excommunicate him. They, they create an index of prohibited books to ban Luther's idea. They create um, the Jesuits in order to spread the word of God. They create the, the Inquisition to put heretics on trial. Um, so the Catholic Church, they respond um, in order to do two things. First, they want to kind of uh, uh, combat the spread of Protestantism and also spread Catholicism. Um, now, the Protestant Reformation has obviously massive social effects with these new religions and the idea that the people can access God on their own, um, some new opportunities for women um, um, in, in some faiths. Um, but perhaps the biggest effect, or, or one of the biggest effects, or sorry, a major political effect was the era of religious wars. Uh, before we get, to, get there, this map shows us where uh, different um, uh, faiths were most popular. So uh, green is Catholic. You can see you know, Spain, France, much of Italy, uh, parts of Germany are still Catholic. But we see Lutheranism, especially in Germany. We see Calvinism, especially in the Netherlands and Switzerland. And Anglicanism, or the Church of England, obviously, in England. So Protestant Revolution, especially popular in Germany, England, Netherlands, Switzerland. Anyways, um, these, the, these, uh, uh, the Protestant Reformation leads to an entire uh, century of religious war from 1555 to 1648. Um, so 1555 to 1648. Um, and um, every single war is, is unique. There's the German Wars of Religion in 1555, the French Wars of Religion in 1598, the Thirty Years War in 1648. But the general cause making generalizations here, looking for similarities across the, the war. Um, the, the kind of common cause of each war is the Holy Roman Empire wants uh, more power and they want to make their entire empire Catholic. And so in each of these uh, wars, we see a common response. We see Protestants uh, fight back to have more independence, but we also see some Catholics um, fight against the HRE to weaken a political enemy. This is most notable uh, France in the Thirty Years' War. France, Catholic France fights against the Catholic Holy Roman Empire to weaken a neighbor. Um, in the end, uh, sorry, uh, we have a common cause. We also have kind of a, a common effect in that the peace treaties um, uh, grant a gradual religious toleration and also gradually weaken the HRE. Peace of Augsburg says Lutheranism is now okay in uh, Germany. The Edict of Nantes says Calvinism, uh, uh, sorry, Huguenots, French Calvinism is now okay in France. Peace of Westphalia says um, uh, uh, basically religious toleration across all of Europe. Um, and so ultimately, um, again, big picture, by the end of the Peace of Westphalia here, by the end of the Peace of Westphalia here, um, the HRE loses. They fail to spread Catholic unity. They begin to decline as a European power and religious toleration becomes the name of the game and becomes the norm across Europe. Um, so HRE loses power, um, will not make all of Europe Catholic. And this is really a turning point as religious toleration uh, spreads and religious wars end. All right, so we've got this one big story, the Renaissance leading to the Reformation, new ideas about 
about society, inspiring people to have new ideas about church, and then the, those new ideas about church inspiring a century of war. Shifting gears a little bit, going behind the scenes of some of those monarchs to talk about new monarchs. Um, one of the things that we see here is that monarchs begin to centralize power. Um, this is not absolutism yet, but this is on the road to absolutism, which we'll get to in period two. Um, and so what do they do? They increase taxes, they centralize power, um, they weaken their enemies. Um, there's also a military revolution, um, new weaponry like gunpowder, um, cannons, guns, things like that, um, makes wars more expensive. You need to have a full-time standing army, massive infantry of tens of thousands of foot soldiers. That's expensive. And so what we really see is um, um, monarchs gaining more power. And the countries that are gonna be the big players for the rest of our course are the countries that are able to consolidate, centralize power, raise tax revenues, things like that. So basically monarchs um, have to uh, raise revenue. They have to uh, gain power in order to compete. And our best examples of that, uh, France, Spain, perhaps the Holy Roman Empire. So not spending a lot of time on, on new monarchs, but this is kind of the first step towards absolutism that we'll get to in period two. Um, now, one of the things that, that new monarchs do, one of the things that these, these new monarchs do in order to raise revenue and in order to centralize power is colonialism. Colonialism or the age of exploration officially starts in 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, um, but really it's the 1500s and 1600s. Um, um, European monarchs are uh, motivated by, by three main motives, uh, God, glory, and gold. They're motivated by God to spread Catholicism. Uh, uh, Catholic Spain especially sent Jesuits to the New World, to the Americas. They're motivated by glory to strengthen their country and to glorify the, the leader back home. And they're motivated by gold, wealth, literally gold, silver, but also spices and other trade. Um, new technology allows um, these journeys um, to occur. The compass tells you where to go. The caravel is a, a long narrow ship that can uh, navigate the seas quickly and easily. The cannon. Uh, the astrolabe tells you where you are in uh, according to latitude and longitude. Um, and so what do we see? We see Spain and Portugal going to Latin America. We see France and England going to North America. Um, and ultimately this allows, um, this, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, countries who can, um, who can successfully create colonies become, uh, you know, world powers. So Spain, England, France, those are the ones that rise to the top. Um, and what do you notice about all of these countries? I mean, it, 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 if I go back to our map here, um, Spain, France, and England, they're all on the coast. They're all on the Atlantic. And so the center of power shifts from the Mediterranean, Italy, to now the Atlantic. Um, now, politically, uh, this is going to have, you know, huge uh, uh, benefits for the monarchs of Spain, England, and France. Um, economically, it's going to make them very wealthy. It's also going to completely change the world with the Columbian Exchange. Uh, the Columbian Exchange is the exchange uh, of new ideas, foods, and diseases between the old and new worlds. Um, uh, for Europe, this means new food like the potato and the tomato, uh, which leads to uh, better diets, longer lifespans, and population growth. For the Americas, well, these new diseases devastate the population. And so for better or for worse, this uh, Colombian exchange, this, this meeting of two worlds in the Americas, it's gonna drastically change both the Americas, destroying the native population, native society, and change Europe as well. Introduction of new foods, longer lifespans and things like that. 
All right. And this shows us uh, where most of the colonies were. So Spain is in the Americas, Portugal along the coast here, uh, England in kind of 13 colonies, France up in Canada as well. And then finally, cultural changes. Um, th this influx of minerals and wealth from the new world increases the quality of life. People are living longer, but also increases prices. So we see inflation. Uh, during this time period, we also see urban centers, towns and cities uh, becoming the center of trade and banking, which is obvious to us today. You go to a big city to go shopping, but that wasn't always the case. Um, and this, this growth in commerce creates a new economic elite, a new wealthy class uh, of nobles and aristocrats. They're going to gain power. Um, so generally speaking, what we're seeing here is um, um, all of this new trade um, leads to uh, an increase in commerce. We see new urban uh, trade centers in cities. Um, and we see... Um, a new wealthy class, which will essentially be like the nobles or the aristocrats. Um, but key distinction here, um, but most of these changes only uh, affect, or rather are there only benefit, the elite, the wealthy. It says normal peasants and women were affected little by all of these changes. I think that's it, yeah. And so, to wrap us up, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of focus on on the trends for each one of these. Um, for our, our our first period of 1450 to 1648, the biggest trend is um, new intellectual ideas, um, challenge traditional uh, knowledge. You've got the Renaissance that has this this new focus on secularism and um, individual greatness. You've got the Reformation that uh, criticizes the Catholic Church. Um, and so you've got these new ideas, these new intellectual ideas that are challenging what people thought they knew. And then in the political sphere, there is kind of an increased competition for uh, European supremacy. Um, the religious wars um, are all about, okay, sure, the HRE wants to make everybody Catholic, but it's really about who's going to dominate Europe. Um, and ultimately, the HRE loses. And then colonialism, again, is all about, um, you know, strengthening um, their, their country, strengthening their uh, uh, economy. And so as we wrap up here, let me see if I can get all of this on one slide or one page rather. Cool. As always, pause if you need to. Um, we've got <clears throat> these um, development evolution of, of new intellectual ideas that eventually leads to an entire century of religious war. By the end of the religious war, um, religious toleration seems to be the name of the game. And then kind of in the background of all of this, monarchs are gaining more power. They're using that power to uh, uh, conquer and colonize other parts of the world, which benefits them, benefits the wealthy, but perhaps not all. <laughs>